Issue 62. It starts with Sonic flying the biplane instead of Tails, and he complains that his plane has been acting weird ever since it started flying over the desert, and he's having trouble with the controls. Only since then? Flashback to last issue where it got blasted by Ixisnogus, but then just flew around just fine after a nosedive, and yet now it's having issues? And Sonic attributing the issue to something other than Ixis? Sonic then immediately proves that he should not be the one flying planes by somehow managing to fly it through the only tree in the entire surrounding desert. At least it flew through it, destroying it instead of crashing into it and getting him hurt. And we get reminded that Tails loves nature by having him look away from the tree being destroyed. Some tanks come up to Sonic and Tails, and a messing looking cyborg eyed guy who looks like Bugs Bunny tells Sonic that he has to come with him in a hurry because they don't have much time. He knows Sonic? But we've seen a whole bunch of people who inexplicably don't know Sonic already. And his other friends don't exactly look trustworthy either. Then we get shown the Devil's Gulag and are given an additional explanation for why it's called that. Because of the ring of volcanoes nearby that superheat the surrounding waters, giving an explanation for why it's a boiling ocean. Snivelyne's still in denial, completely convinced that he'll be able to think his way out of the prison. Now I'm sure Duke's Ex Machina will just fall on his lap rather than him actually coming up with something intelligent. He also shows that he's been working out a little, not that it matters. I mean, he's just planning to send robots after people. It's not like he wants to fight Sonic himself. As Draco the traitor laughs at him, we see a conversation between Sonic and Jack by some text bubbles connected to tanks. And good, it turns out we were supposed to not know who the rabbit guy was. And he finally lampshades how stupid it is that anyone on Mobius would not know Sonic the Hedgehog. He says that Robotnik's sub-bosses used to run the show here, wherever here is. I can't really get to invest in this place until I know that. But once Sonic beat Robotnik, Sandblasters were inspired to make the same move, and it worked! Cheating Sonic out of a victory for himself, although it does belong more to the Sandblasters who actually suffered here. And I really don't like his right eye. There's no eyeball in there! Just wear a patch! Was this design choice really necessary? Then someone warns Jack and Sonic that they've got trouble up ahead, just because they have Robians in front of them. Sonic surprises me by keeping his cool when Jack makes a racist remark that no Robian ever is friendly, as all he says is, as a matter of fact, yeah. You'd think he'd be boiling from hearing that. Problem is, these Robians have a creepy glow to their eyes and are standing menacingly and are all one grey color, meaning that they're not good guys. I guess they're still without free will. Sonic and Tails get blasted at, and it turns out the enemies are trying to change their route with their opti bursts. Just call them lasers. While Sonic attacks the Robians with a sand tornado being aerokinetic and all, Tails says to Jack that he thinks that these particular Robians aren't acting like they're under anyone's control, even though he acknowledges that they seem mindless. What? If they're, they're not acting like they're anyone's control, but they're evil. After they all come back to the Sandblaster's home, which is a city that looks just purple and monochrome, with what I'm guessing is a yellow force field above it, we cut to outer space, where a satellite says that it's back online, starting to locate a target, followed by a person we can't see pressing a button. I guess that person is who the satellite's talking to. I'm confused that Sonic is stunned instead of smiling at seeing a giant statue of himself. And when someone who's got confident as one of his defining character traits, and was incredibly egotistical in the early issues, in fact. Wouldn't he be ecstatic at seeing himself be worshipped by a whole city of fanboys from? Instead, he's acting like someone who isn't confident, who doesn't think they're worthy of that kind of celebration. And I guess that does make him a deeper character, implying that he's more than his bravado act on the outside, but this isn't how I'd expect Sonic to be. Sonic is told by someone that with him around, the city might not need a force field anymore to keep out the evil robots. Does that imply they're planning on keeping Sonic around, even against his will? After we see a laser blast presumably get blocked by a force field, Snively drops a nail file making a clink sound, and somehow that magically opens every single cell in the prison. Because apparently they designed the cell doors to be openable by the specific particular sound of a nail file falling to a metal floor. I was expecting a Duke's Ex Machina to, to free Snively, but I guess my standards were too damn high. I was expecting it to be Ixis Nogus, either intentional on his part or he destroys the prison by accident. 
and was only really thinking of Snively being freed. Also, I'd like to point out that all the havoc that will probably be caused by these criminals all escaping their cells would have never happened if people had just been smart enough to execute them instead of wasting money and resources on keeping complete monsters alive. I mean, this isn't real life. It's not like any of them could possibly be redeemed. So what's the point? Is, is it really... What's the point of putting the prison in the exact location it is, then, if all an escaping prisoner has to do is steal an airship and fly away? I guess the airship's controls must be really user-friendly to the point where you don't have to have flight pilot training to learn how to fly one to escape the island. Sonic and Tails wake up groggy the next morning because they all celebrated too much last night. Tails then gets scared because the doors to the room is being locked from the outside, imprisoning them. That's pretty unsubtle of them. I mean, they, they could at least lock the door to the building as a whole. They don't have to... Well, I guess that would inconvenience a lot more than just Sonic and Tails. Since Tails had fortunately escapes really effortlessly because writers remember that he can fly, and when Jack tells him that he's going to fix the biplane by cleaning it of sand and then steal it for a few weeks, Sonic shows that he's the carefree foil to Tails' is worrying by not caring about staying in the city for that long. He doesn't seem to realize the amount of damage Ixus could cause while he's staying at the city. From how far away can Ixus be tracked? If there's a limit to it, then what if waiting for too long will make it hard to find him? Unfortunately, the story ends right then and there, even though it feels like it's right in the middle of the story. The next story starts with Jeffrey finding an intruder in his armored cubicle, and his confident attitude is shaken when a bomb blows up right next to him. But he's magically just fine, despite being right next to an explosion, and simply falls backwards with no injuries. Much later in the comic, take note. And it turns out it's Heavy and Bomb, who are actually being used as characters again. Heavy helps Jeffrey up and gets my sympathy by saying that Bomb and him have been looking for some place to fit in, and he's their last hope. Well, that was a bad first impression on him. Heavy says that as a cybernetic drone, he can tap into any database, and Robotnik did his best to keep tabs on him. Wait, any database? I call bullshit. Then the comic impressed me by caring enough to give an actual explanation to why Bomb doesn't kill himself every time he explodes. He transfers his AI to another shell ready to go when he blows. It reminds me of the whole backup unit for every robot plot point in Futurama. So it's pretty easy for me to believe that that's the case. So Jeffrey, despite his primary flaw of being irrational paranoia, immediately agrees to hire these robots who made a bad first impression on him, proving that he's a better person than Hamlin, who still holds a grudge against him for jumping him at first sight. It is pretty weird that he's a lot more suspicious of Robians like Uncle Chuck than Heavy and Bomb, though. So he trusts literal robots of Eggman more than Robians. Jeffrey then goes on a long explanation to his group of elites about everything but what the device in his hand from last issue is, stating the obvious for a while before saying that it has an automatic targeting sight oscope and can serve as a laser blaster despite not looking like it at all. Thing is, he describes the laser as delivering the impact of a brick hitting a plate glass window. That sounds like a huge understatement considering what he's showing here. Wombat Stu, the Australian kid, says that he's never seen Freedom Fighters use weapons like that. But your group used bomberings. But lasers are too much for them? Jeffrey tries to talk as if Secret Service agents are better than Freedom Fighters just because they have these laser shooters. One, it was Freedom Fighters who took down Eggman, and Freedom Fighters who took down Crockpot, flying up beside. And second, Rotor's shown plenty of laser shooting devices, so you think Jeffrey would know about them. Oh, but I guess he's talking about this particular laser shooter, because it's so much better than all of the other laser shooting devices, including the giant one Murder had. Jeffrey reminds his friends of the obvious, that Secret Service agents are supposed to protect the monarchy and the government from all enemy forces, internal and external. He should have said, the monarchy and the government in general, because the monarchy is part of the government. So that sentence was redundant. Also, how is that not already the Freedom Fighters' job? What exactly makes these guys different, other than them not having people with special powers like Sonic, Tails, and Bunny? After Jeffrey shows how cynical he is, which makes sense of a paranoid spy, he tells his friends that they need to train in every method of armed and unarmed combat. That's gonna take a while. Can't you just give them ray guns? Well, I guess if he has to be sure. He then says that he'll start with Hershey. 
Maybe because he has a crush on her and wants her to be better capable of protecting herself. Or maybe because she's a girl and needs training more. Hershey then gets put underwater for some reason as part of her training. Her first mission, mind you. I like how Hershey is scared of water like a cat is expected to be. It makes her being a cat Mobian in particular feel more significant compared to her just being any other type of Mobian. Even if she is probably exhibiting stereotypes of cat Mobians. This is much better than her referencing cats having nine lives as a joke. At least I think it's a joke and she doesn't literally have nine lives because this actually makes sense. Hydrophobia is a pretty common phobia, although Sonic should have that, not her. She notices Bomb being thrown by Valdez at the robot fish, to which are being used to risk the lives of first-timers instead of harmless dummies or regular people who can hold back. Really? Jeffrey says that they showed a basic idea of teamwork. The issue ends with Jeffrey encouraging them like a drill sergeant to not give up on the training. The first story was written by Carl Bullers. I'm glad the Sandblaster City got introduced. It's another interesting bit of world building. Really, the search for Aces and August was a brilliant excuse for world building in Mobius, showing what it's like beyond the Acorn Kingdom. We've already seen it to Australia, England, and even China. It's a shame I don't know where this place is. I had a feeling this city was kind of sinister from the minute Sonic looked stunned and speechless at seeing it for the first time. And I'm getting the suspicion that the city plans on trying to keep Sonic and Tails in it for as long as possible to take advantage of their hero capabilities. Well, that is a pragmatic choice that's good in their own way, and Sonic does consent to it, even if Tails is still worried about Ixus Nogus running free without them tracking him. So aside from the aesthetic complaint of Jack's right eye looking distractingly terrible, this was a pretty good story for creating intrigue and leading to another story building on it. The real problem with the story is how absolutely bullshit and lazy Snively's escape was. All that build up and he drops a nail file? Really? Is that the best they could come up with? Not Ixus crashing into the prison or destroying it just to cause trouble? Even I could have come up with something better than that. Shawshank Redemption, this ain't. This is just insulting. And Snively does show embarrassment at how even he doesn't really know how easy the escape was when it's told to brag about it. But that are they just trying to play this for laughs? Because that doesn't excuse how bullshit it is. And the second story about Ten Penders was so short with so little happening in it. And I had Jeffrey getting his group of elites for the Secret Service together. And while I love how Heavy and Bomb are finally going to be made proper use of when they kind of disappeared after the Knuckles Chaotic special, and how nice it was of Jeffrey to forgive Bomb for the bad first impression, what kind of first timer training's this? They put them underwater to fight a robot fish without any sort of combat training or weapons? If it weren't for Bomb, they would have been killed! And I still don't see how Hershey and Wombat Sue actually belong here. They're normal people with no special powers and no skills whatsoever to offer. 